Everybody, welcome to a very special episode of Textiles and Tea. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the advertising manager for HGA, and I get to be your host today. And today is a really special day for two reasons. First of all, it's our 100th episode. Who knew? When we started this almost two years ago, we thought, ah, something to do during uh, COVID. We'll do a few episodes and that'll be it. But it has been so much fun to do. We've been so excited to present this to our, our members and to the fiber world that we're gonna just keep going. And to celebrate our 100th episode, we have the one and only Sheila Hicks. I am so excited about today. Don't forget, we got questions, put them in the q and I'm really not gonna be able to see them today in the chat. So if you have questions, please put them in the q and and not the chat. So let me introduce you to Sheila Hicks, although everybody knows who she is. Sheila was born in 1934 in Hastings, Nebraska. She resides in Paris and has for the last 60 years. She's received three degrees from Yale University of Art, a BFA, an MFA, and in 2019, an honorary doctorate. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm sure Sheila will help me with this if I've got it wrong, she is the only person to have gotten an honorary doctorate in her field. During a, she, during a Fulbright scholarship in 1957-58, she photographed extensively and deepened her interest in textiles. She has led workshops in Mexico, Chile, Israel, the Middle East. She's worked in five continents. Sheila has been invited to show at the Venice Biennial, the Whitney Biennial, the Sao Paulo Biennial, and numerous museums. Her work has been acquired by major museums worldwide, including the St. Louis Art Museum. She continues to direct an active studio in Paris and has a full exhibition program for the next few years. Welcome, Sheila. There she is. We are so excited to have you here today. I do it's wanna a, say, I, I love it that St. Louis was mentioned because St. Louis Weavers Guild is our sponsor for this episode. <laughs> and we're so excited to have Kara here today too. So we do wanna thank the, and Kara, you used to work in St. Louis, right? At the museum there? Yes, I had a very happy 14 years as curator of decorative arts and design at the St. Louis Art Museum and love the museum in St. Louis. Well, thank you, the Weavers Guild. And this is in honor of Dorothy, Dorothy Hoddock. Dorothy, I'm sure, is looking down and is so excited to be part of this today. Well, Sheila, we're going to start off with the kind of silly question, which is, what is your favorite tea? 
Yeah, you smoke? Your favorite tea. I know you gave me a long time to think about this. <laughs> and that meant I had so many choices. And I cleaned out my cupboard. And I put them all on the counter. And I tried them all this week to be honest and sort of um, not just say any old thing. Uh -huh. So I drank about 17 different teas that I happen to have here in the in the placard. Um, and then I started mixing them to see how the different cocktail of teas could be. Why just out of the package or why just in the little tea bags? Why not sort of open them up and see if they can become new or uh, unexpected flavors? savers huh um the more i got mixed thanksgiving was approaching so i thought that gave me ideas of what i could serve at the thanksgiving dinner because i had a big family coming they objected they each had <laughs> something particular in mind and they didn't think it was um, worthwhile to be adventurous and to mix teas and tea flavors and tea leaves I don't know how you and your group feel about it, but it's just in my nature to do that kind of thing. Not to do it the way it's usually done, or because it's supposed to be done, or because it's pre prescribed that way. And it's always been since I was about seven or eight years old and went to a little girls camp in Minnesota. And the counselor sent me home with a note at the end of the camp saying, your daughter has a spirit of contradiction. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and you see, it's just, it's just continued throughout. And you talked to me about joining you for a hundredth anniversary. I took it to mean my hundredth anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did another show this year for their hundredth anniversary. So we're getting all your hundredth anniversaries in this year, but you're not a hundred, so it can't be your anniversary. Well, I mean, I thought that gave me time to get ready. Oh, <laughs> we'll check back. How's that? A little, a little bit of lead time. Okay, that's good. That's good. Well, would you share with the group, for those who don't know your history, how you got started in fiber? I think uh, I probably complained if my mother put something on my baby bed that scratched. And I, I went for something that was smooth, delicate, agreeable, sensual, of course. Mm -hmm. So it was probably from a very early infant age. And as I grew up, my mother helped me make all my clothes. So in school, I always showed up in something that I was sure no one else had. And it's, you see, it's, it's sort of um, starts at before becoming a teenager. Before teenagers start getting influenced and jealous of each other. Mm. Um, and this was all embedded in my uh, personal attitudes very, very early on. But I think people from Nebraska are kind of strange anyway, you know. <laughs> They're kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. And they sort of wake up in the morning and look at the horizon. And sometimes, as far as you can see, you just see corn blowing in the fields or wheat blowing. You imagine that you're at the beach, maybe, or something along the horizon. Um, but we never ate a fish in our family until we were practically adults. It's just, you know, it's just sort of weird out there. <laughs> in a kind of nice way, in a kind of nice way. St. Louis, my little brother was born in St. Louis. Oh, really? It was a mistake, I think. But um, I think they were trying to get back to Nebraska and he popped out in St. Louis. We have several connections then to Is there Louis. a Barnes Hospital in your in the city? <clears throat> Barnes Hospital? I, I don't know. I don't know. St. Louis? Barnes Hospital? Yes. It's a big hospital there. Are you from St. Louis? No, I'm not. 
Well, I, I, some of these people who are joining us will know if there's a hospital called Barnes Hospital. Me, absolutely. Yeah. We've already got people signing in from Nebraska saying hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> well, when you were talking about cornfields, we're going to try something today. There's a video clip I want to show, and it is um, it was made for your exhibit off the grid that was at the Hepworth, Hepworth Wakefield. And we're gonna try playing it. Let's see if it works. Everybody cross your fingers. I'm gonna yes. start with the experience I had as a child. Playing mm -hmm. hide and seek in cornfields and being very close in touch with nature and experiencing it physically. I didn't realize at the time how much that would carry forth but I can see now that these are quite often throwbacks from impressions of very, very early childhood. I wanted to show that because I was so struck by just reading everything about you and watching videos is that you absorb everything around you. You're so aware of your environment. And I, I heard you talking about playing tag in the corn and how it feels on your face. So it, it just seems that this, your awareness of your environment really seems to play into your work. Would you agree with that? Is that correct? Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Because <laughs> I've seen you talk about things that you see and then you seem to refer it back to what you're making or what you're going to make. Mm -hmm. That's what that film just did. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that exhibition that you mentioned, Hepworth Wakefield that just finished, I put a big panel, a handwoven panel with cotton warp and all of the weft um, in cotton was interspersed with shreds of corn husks inside. It was uh, hung in the middle of the room and you could see it from both sides. And so in the uh, interstices of the weaving, the light was denser or more shadowed. And mm -hmm. you felt like you were at the beach or something looking through clouds. We were looking through cotton and corn. And that was in Wakefield, England. People inevitably came up and touched it and curious and wanted to see what it was. And I encourage that. The guards don't, but I do. <laughs> do you, um, it's interesting that you talk about you use corn husk in that piece. How do you choose the material you're going to use? And do you find that you, because I know you live in Paris some of the time you live in the United States, and you've traveled, do you find that you choose a material that has a relationship to where you live or what's available to where you are or where, where the piece is gonna end up eventually? How do you decide the material you're gonna use? Wish I knew because you see, tomorrow I'm gonna to start working early in the morning <laughs> and I'm not sure yet what material I'm gonna use. It'll have, uh -huh. to do with, uh, it'll have something to do with when I walk out in my greenhouse Water the plants, pick up the leaves that are falling on the floor, touch the ceramic tiles, sit in the membre in the wooden chair with a woven seat, fix my coffee and grind the coffee. All of those will make, make can sort of contribute to what I'm going to touch next and what and the napkin that I choose. If I'm eating a croissant or something messy, messy, or what I forgot to take off that I was wearing to go to sleep the night before, and that I was still wearing, all of these touch sensations, tactile awareness, and color, whether it's raining in the greenhouse and the rain is pouring on the glass on the roof, causing the colors to look different, differently than when it's sunny and uh, what's blooming 
what's about to bloom. All of these things contribute to where I'm going to migrate physically, uh, visually, tactily. It sounds complicated, but it's not, because uh, it all just comes naturally. Then the doorbell rings, <laughs> and I'll go down to the studio and walk down a wooden, oh, 300 year old wooden staircase and hold on to an old railing that's in metal and sometimes put on leather gloves or wool gloves when I hold the railing. And especially with COVID, we're so conscious now, then you put on a mask too and put on three or four scarves. You sort of bundle yourself up and walk through the cobblestone courtyard. And when you get into the studio and look at something on the wall and you say, I wonder where that came from. It's not very nice. Take that down, please. And then the answer is, but Sheila, you made that last week. I know, but I don't like it. Today, I don't like it. Today, I like something else. Today, I'm going to choose something else. You asked me a question that was a very long question. I gave you a very long answer. We love long answers. Those are great. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting as I, I read more about you, and again, I watched some of your videos and interviews, is that you, you don't shy away from any material that it seems like the world is your palette in a way that you are open and willing to use whatever fiber or material you find. Uh, if you see, uh, it's kind of fun to, to join all of you because I know your I know your cornerstone is fiber and fiber art. Um, I don't think I ever chose fiber or fiber art. I think it chose me. It's strange. I didn't consciously think I was going to pursue this kind of work for 60 years. Huh. But um, I don't notice. I just start making drawings, tearing papers, pushing things together, stepping on uh, things to crush them on the ground, in the, on the floor, pick them up and poke them into other kinds of surfaces and see how they manage to hold or fall out or what to do to make them stay in. These are the kind of experiences that I do sort of intuitively. And then someone says, oh, looks like fiber art. So it makes it sound like Fiber art is something that has a certain look, but I think fiber art is completely wide open. In fact, it's one of the most wide open possibilities for research and for creation. And I think many, many more people are so-called fiber artists than they even realize. I mean, we've applied that title to a lot of activity but uh, it's pretty, it's in the kitchen even when you're cooking. Mm -hmm. You're probably a fiber artist in the kitchen when you're cooking. Well, I, I know you've told this story probably a million times, but it, it's so wonderful. Could, could you let, could you share with the audience how you first began weaving? It's a great story. It's a, a great happening in your life, I think the frame that you made and I think it happened with um, I think it happened in uh, sitting in a dark room and watching slide projection by my art history teacher George Kugler at the art history department at Yale mm -hmm. it was a course about pre-Columbian art and wonderful slides showing uh, Machu Picchu and all of the uh, archaeological sites in pre-Hispanic America. And always he flashed on the screen mummy bundles that were uh, intact and then mummy bundles that were unwrapped. And I thought, um, who would dare unwrap a mummy bundle and peek inside? That's kind of private, isn't it? <laughs> might even be intrusive to do that. 
I don't think we can do, get away with that today to go dig up graves and open the mummies and unwrap them and peek inside and poke around. Right. Well, the Egyptians are doing it. The Egyptians are still doing it. They're un, they're digging up their their archaeological uh, sites, poking around, unwrapping and inspecting and x-raying and looking. Um, before you know it, you're intrigued by all the fibrous materials, all of the materials that you start analyzing and thinking about and seeing how they're joining and opening and crossing and wrapping and enveloping. And before you know it, you're identifying with it totally. You are the kind of mummy being enveloped by the whole fibrous experience. So how did it begin? I think it began sitting and saw and seeing that slide on the screen in this dark room in uh, in this class. It's in this in uh, in about 1954, 55. It's funny then. The path was opened and then others realizing my enthusiasm and interest in this I feel still facilitated by offering to send me to South America on a Fulbright scholarship to Chile. That gave me, that enabled me to go either take a plane and go to Santiago or to go by land. Mm -hmm. When I looked at the map, I thought, oh, this could be really interesting to go by land. And that's what I did. And that's when the whole fiber world opened up when you go to the Altiplano and you visit the villages and you visit the uh, people who just take two branches or two sticks and, and uh, pull threads between them or yarns between them, sit on the ground or tie themselves up on one end to a tree and one end to them around their own waist and do a kind of uh, miraculous crossing of lines colored lines in all the directions, intricately, simply, or very, very complex structures. The pre incaic weaving is now judged to be the most intricate, intelligent weaving in the world, in the history of weaving, more so than Asia, which we all mm. respect, more so than uh, Middle Eastern, European, the pre kind of weaving of a, 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 people who did not have an alphabet or read or write developed intellectually and visually and manually incredibly complex constructions and combinations of materials and shapes. Mm -hmm. And things that had fully conceived salvages, not just cut off of looms, not just a weaving that was then cut from a loom, but imagined a way to devise a system, therefore take either two sticks or a little frame and find a way to find a way to unite and cause to escape the discipline and boredom of repetition and liberate on those simple with those simple tools all of these lines flying in in thousands of different combinations and directions and becoming fabrics textiles clothes environments, entire environments, architecture. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of architecture, I wanted to look at these two pieces that we've got next. <clears throat> and what one of the things I loved about this is that they they aren't just standing there. They either are coming out of the ceiling or, as you pointed out to me, they're going up into the ceiling. And it just changes the appearance of it. There's a infinity to it because I don't know what goes beyond the ceiling. 
So can you talk some about your choices of, of um, installing the work in this manner? I think the two, maybe I should identify those two photographs. Would you please? You. That would be wonderful. Because <laughs> coincidentally, they're both in New York. The one on the left side of the screen is going through and into the ceiling of the Whitney Museum on uh, Madison Avenue. Um, the one on the right, I think is going through the ceiling of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, how The first one, when I proposed it, they took two days to answer. They didn't say yes, they didn't say no. They said, how, how? How are you going to do that and involve having a man crawl in the space up above the ceiling in a crawl space and feed things into him and let him find ways to solidify it into a structure where all of the electric, electric and electronic equipment was. But they went for it and let me do it. And uh, it caused people when they saw it walking into the room not just to look at it like they do a painting or they would look at a sculpture which you'd look at straight on and face to face mm -hmm. inevitably the gaze would start to move upwards to see where in the world is it going mm -hmm. and where do you think it ends and why are you doing this it was to say i'm here in this building and this is a special building with a marcel breuer architecture let's take advantage of the architecture and let's dialogue with the architecture and cause the person who's the viewer or public to also do the same thing and to imagine that they were tripping up into the ceiling and might keep going they might end up very high in the sky somewhere mm -hmm. they didn't they could go through that ceiling they could go through the next ceiling they could go through the roof they might end up I know there's a building in New York that's on uh, 57th Street. Now I'm going to see it in two weeks. How tight? It's about 80 or 90 floors high. Suppose you took the elevator out and just put fiber in the middle of the elevator shaft mm -hmm. <laughs> and let people walk up and down yes. and enjoy it. And enjoy it. <laughs> like Jack and the Beanstalk. <laughs> And then the one on the right, what we did is just <clears throat> literally slice into the ceiling and, and allow it to grow. So it really moves right through the ceiling. It probably goes up two or three stories in there. But, you know, the guards won't let us up to take a look. I, I love that effect. It just opens the mind and... Um, and that's what your work does. The other thing I loved is, <clears throat> excuse me, especially the, the video we showed, showed at the beginning and you were working with some of the threads is that you appreciate that fiber has a suppleness that, um, that you can really manipulate and work um, in your pieces. It also has an energy. And I, I wonder if, and th this is a great example of that. And I was wondering if you can talk some about this piece, but also is that one of the things that attracted you to doing fiber was the suppleness and the energy? If you grab a banana in your hand <laughs> and squeeze it, it's all going to squish through your fingers. If you grab a bam piece of bamboo and hold it in your hands, it's going to have a nice cool feeling to it and but still be slightly flexible slightly supple mm -hmm. and if you take a whole fistful of ropes and group them together in your hand it has another reaction it invites you to play the game with it and to move and take more threads and wrap around and as you wrap and then pull tightly, it starts to wiggle. It starts to <laughs> wiggle in your hand. And you say, that looks like a 
button. And as it wiggles, you change colors. And then maybe thinner and thicker and thinner and thicker. And this piece that's here in this photograph was hanging in my dining room on a pole. And people would come to dinner and watch it while they were eating. I mean, uh, it might have ruined their dinner, but they, they got <laughs> probably spilled a few glasses of wine as they were looking at it. But sometimes they wanted me to take one of them down just to see what it felt like, and we could pass it around the table. You can't do that with much art. Uh -uh. But you can with this. In your hands, when you move it and start passing around from one to the other, it starts to link the different persona, the different personage, autour de table, huh? and it unifies. It unifies. It starts to help conversation and communication. Mm. And when you start to assemble them and let them do their own thing, their dance, their tribal expression, um, humor breaks loose, and children, I should say, adults turn into children. Adults regress joyfully into childhood and feel like they can also join this conversation, this dance. And uh, I don't have it in my dining room anymore because people have taken it home. Each one. <laughs> <take it different. laughs> but I keep making it. I keep making it because I enjoy <laughs> making it. And each time I make it, it's different. They're never two the same. Well, one thing about fiber and, and about your work in fiber is that there's a huge continuum of materials when we look at this material. And then I want to talk about this next one, which is completely different. And it's the um, probably one of your most well-known works. And it's at the Ford Foundation and it's in the boardroom as well as the auditorium. And it's these beautiful discs that you wrapped in thread. Um, it just blows my mind that you did this and the amount of time it took to do it. Um, can you talk wrapped. some about this piece? It's not wrapped, you know, they're not threads that are wrapped. They're, it's silk thread that is stitched into a linen textile. There you go. Right. Thank you. Thank you. So it's just it's drawing a thread across from one side to the other of a circle and just continuing in the orbit like a clock, carefully stitching and over overlapping. It builds up on its own. And the acoustically, um, it had a purpose. Therefore, uh, they allowed me to do this because oh. architects think of the decor and the environment and the look of what they want in their in their space they're very possessive so it's their space what would they accept and want in their space well with acoustical properties you're halfway home therefore the feeling of even warmth and uh, familiarity and the ancient tapestries and all the chateaus in europe mm and all the hangings in the Middle East, and the tents, and all of this. You're halfway home if it has human, attractive, seductive properties, and it's livable, and that you don't mind looking at it. In fact, you're enjoying looking at it frequently for a long time, not just to visit to a museum and to see a painting for a half an hour or 10 minutes, and you may come back and see the painting again, next school vacation or something. Um, but this is something you really sort of live with intimately. And the Ford Foundation have meetings. They're very serious and last for hours and hours and hours. And they thought, what can we do, the architects with the clients? What can we do and put on these walls that people are gonna put up with? Put on the wall something they will put up with for a long time. And that's what we did. We came up with this design. It's just stitching because you take the trip, your voyage with that thread in the medallion of the moving symbolically to 
of thinking. We're in this meeting, we're starting this meeting, and at the end of this meeting, we will have completed a thought, an idea, and it will go out into space and have an effect on our society because we had a beginning, a middle, and an end. I, I cannot imagine what it must be like to sit in that room and look at look at that wall. It just um, just the different textures and the light play. Uh, what a great place to have a meeting. <laughs> Shadows move also with the lighting that can be time, timed and dimmed. Oh. Oh, that's that would be amazing. Now, can, can that? I think you can put people to sleep if you put it on a dimmer and timer <laughs> in a meeting. <laughs> now, can people go in there and look at that? Is it open to the public? By probably, what's open to the public these days with all the security measures? Uh, true, true. Now, this just got refreshed, right? Didn't you go in within the last well, 10 not years? Refreshed. Not refreshed. You want to hear a sad story? I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> fire department. Fire department came in and asked the uh, building managers um, if their premises had been fireproofed. And so they came in and sprayed everything. And uh, it affected the threads when they tried with the uh, air conditioning and the heating system. It affected the threads and the president of Ford Foundation was so embarrassed he didn't know what to do when they tried to ignore it and just keep living with it as it was deteriorating. Oh. But it got to be embarrassing for somebody like the Ford Foundation. <laughs> so they contacted me and asked if we could redo the whole thing. I said it took two years to do the first time round. Another two years? <laughs> So we thought, who could do it for us? We've got the design, we know how to specify the materials. And they said, no, you know, think it through. Ford Foundation is, has to set examples. They can't use child labor or subcontracted labor or, you know, all the kinds of things that the, uh, our, most of our manufacturers do who are making mm -hmm. our clothes. The labels, you can't believe half the labels in your clothes, right? Right. Where they're made and who made them and how they made. So we're we, being purist. Um, we join hands. We said, OK, two more years. Let's do it again. So we did it twice. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. <laughs> That's truly really amazing. <laughs> you see it now, you'll see the identical second version huh second wow. and identical to the first huh wow maybe even better because after you sew a thousand <laughs> three hundred medallions you get better as you go along <laughs> i bet i bet <laughs> you know you do these large pieces so let's go down to the other extreme and talk about some of the smaller pieces that you do this next image we have is a whole wall of them they're each individual artworks, and I'm going to pronounce it badly, but I'm going to give it a shot. And they're menemes. Am I close? Didn't we try that out in the rehearsal? <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Where'd you I go? I still don't have it. <laughs> but my my inability to pronounce things aside, would you talk about these pieces? What should we should we try again? Go ahead. Yes. Minim. 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 M I N I M E. Minim. Something, you know, minimal. Yeah, minimal, Petite. yeah. Petite. But they're not. They're beautiful. Yes, they're, they're, um, they're little infantile tapestries of just playfulness, huh? of just uh, trials and discoveries, successes and failures and um, explorations. Mm. A lot of them are four salvage finished pieces. You know, they're not cut off of, uh, they're not scraps, or they're not quilts, or they're not patches. They're not collages. Although I like all those things too. 
<laughs> but the, these I these I sort of use them like a page of paper. Ah, a pre, okay. A pre a pre prescribed size, and then begin to come at it from all sides, and enter the lines or the threads, top to bottom or bottom to top or side to side or up to the side and then up to the and then a detour and then a another exploration. I'm trying different things. And it's so small, it's like a page of paper. Do you find that working on these leads you to bigger pieces or? Inevitably, they give you ideas. Uh -huh. You find a verb and you find a noun and you start to write a poem. I like that, that's great. We talked, you talked earlier about um, how people touch your work and I, I was just struck by, you do not view your work as so precious that nobody can touch it. Um, it has to be walled off and, you know, plexiglass and off to the side. You really invite people to be part of the work to, like we have an image here of people sitting on your work. Um, can you talk some more about that? It sounds like that's an important part of that for you. Well, this is a um, rather special, um, this is a colossal mistake. This is the Palais de Tokyo in Paris. Uh huh. Where they had a big stage where you lead up with stairs to the stage, the platform. And uh, they invited me to perform on the stage with whatever material I chose with whatever characters or participants or actors who would wander in because it's a public museum. So anybody can wander in mm -hmm. and be invited to go up on the stage and do their thing. And I was giving them the okay, the, okay, the, the green light to go up on that stage and do their thing. And you can see someone just took photographs. I like this woman's legs over here on the left. I like this boy who's decided to enjoy life. <laughs> and the other, and then there's the the conversation going on behind where people could care less. They could be on a park bench or they could be in a living room or they could be in a, a discotheque or a bar or something. They're probably sorting out their personal problems or their friendship just parked there, but feeling good, feeling good on this soft enveloping form. And then, uh, then some guys over here, I think, having lunch. I think I see a glass and some picnic or something. <laughs> the museum let them come in and use my stage, and some of them returned frequently. I think they read, I think they prolong the, wouldn't call it an exhibition, but I think they prolong the installation for two or three times, you know, over a period of a year. And I think in Paris, People are used to going to sidewalk cafes and sitting and um, meeting their friends or waiting for something to happen, like maybe meeting a friend. Um, and I think that that spirit fit that museum mm -hmm. so that anybody any age could come in and participate and they, uh, in the twisted Torsade, you see the white on the side on the right? Mm -hmm. It's just it's just linen drawn out about three meters, four meters maybe, and then letting it fall and letting it twist and letting it spill on the floor and crash. And it's just like uh, rain, it's like raining, raining linen. Mm -hmm. Splashing, splashing <laughs> on the stage there. Um it's a walk through of a little moment of pleasure in get off the metro, get out of the rain, go into a nice friendly place and hang out. <laughs> well, the next image we're gonna show is your exhibit off the grid as we, we talked about it earlier to end this show. And the one thing I, I want you to talk some about is your idea of, of 
space and your works in space. I know you you think very clearly about that. And this is a beautiful exhibit of your work. Would you talk some more about that? Well, you, you made a nice choice of slides. Thank you, you and Kara also. Because here now, after that informality of the Palais de Tokyo, here's a David Chipperfield, um, impeccably designed and uh, constructed building about an hour from London. Um, Chipperfield, I think, did the extension of the St. Louis Art Museum, no? Yes. Um, he also was scheduled to do the extension of the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which they have now turned over to a Mexican woman. Life is full of surprises. <laughs> But here is his museum in um, the countryside, in this uh, coal mining region, industrial and coal mining region of England. But it's a beautiful, beautiful space with um, <clears throat> which they turned over to me in which I was able to fill with um, all kinds of things that I like, cotton, linen, synthetic fibers, silk, bamboo corn husks <laughs> slate, <laughs> slate nurses blouses uh, baby bands um, I, the catalog is all going to press in about three weeks of this show they did the catalog after we did the show mm. because they wanted to see the things in the context of the architecture and with the natural daylight Well, what's next for you? What's next big thing for you? Our little thing. The next big thing to after being um, after behaving myself and not traveling and rest staying quietly in my courtyard the last couple of years through all of the um, health concerns that we've all lived through, I'm going to take the chance of taking a plane and come to New York and have a show opening on the 10th of December in New York. Oh, great. Where is it? It's at uh, Seacomer Jenkins Gallery. I think it's on West 22nd Street. Okay. But I think it'll be fun to go because I'll probably, my timing is such that I won't be able to arrive until the day it opens. So. Oh. I'll participate in the hanging which I usually like to do I usually like to participate in the hanging um, so I'm going to go and see an exhibition you say what's the next thing for me I'm going to leave my courtyard I'm going to leave Paris I'm going to take a chance I'm going to take a plane and I'm going to go and see my exhibition in New York that's wonderful good for you you know, we have a bunch of questions. So let's take some questions from our viewers, if that's all right with you. Bye. A lot of people saying hi. <laughs> uh, Nancy Page says, just a comment. I saw your display at the Cleveland Museum of Art. It was great and a wonderful surprise. We were there to see the tapestries and that had just been cleaned. So thank you, Nancy, for that comment. Um, Margot Selby wants to know how many people do you have working in your studio with you to put on a show such as the one at the Wakefield? Well, it's the putting on a show like that <clears throat> means as many people on site as it is in the prep. The prep is in the studio. Uh huh. And the prep is also in the making of the fiber, which is off premises. And then it all comes together in um, on site. So do you mean to make a show? How many people? I'm getting a show ready now for St. Gallen, St. Gallen, St. Gallen in Switzerland, an old textile city in Switzerland. Uh -huh. um, I'm told there are a lot of people already working over there, getting ready. And so on Zoom, that's how we live today when we're doing shows a lot. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to be following on Zoom how, what and how and the prep that goes on. And I know that people were down in the cave in the Sousol today in my courtyard, bagging and netting synthetic fiber bundles. And I was out at the warehouse yesterday morning, pulling things from crates and looking and pulling things from other exhibitions that I want to reintegrate in this show. So that sounds like a simple question. How many people are you working and who's doing it? Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> I feel like orchestra leader, but that I've got sunglasses on and I'm thinking all about this exhibition in my head. And if I took my sunglasses off, I'd look out and I'd see how many different people are involved in different ways. You know, lighting, prep, creating, customs. We're in a world today when you ship stuff across the border. It involves a lot of paperwork. Mm. I really, so I mean, I don't know. My, my heart goes out to these people who are all working in all of these different capacities to make any show today happen because there's so much involved. Yeah, yeah. Curators were inspired and we'll meet other people along the way who are also inspired. They have very long dialectical sort of conversations about how these things are supposed to be done and what the results should be or hopefully should not be. Mm -hmm. and what is the political implication and what is the sociological validation for this show mm -hmm. so i have to get involved in discussions and um, polemical discussions wow I have to try and convince people that uh, i know what i'm doing <laughs> <laughs> And it may not be their way, but maybe would they give it a try and do it my way? And if it doesn't work, we'll do it again, their way. Um, I'm trying to figure out which one of these to ask. There's so many. Um, somebody was asking about, it's kind of a long question, but let me see if I can summarize it. You were talking about how your work is intuitive. And this is from Trad Troyer. And he said that fiber is often a very long process that requires planning and a lot of repetition, like the disc. So he was wondering, how do you reconcile the intuition with a monotonous process such as wrapping? I'm assuming he's talking about the disc and that was sewing. But uh, I think I've already explained, probably his question was formulated before I, explained of working on the small minims uh -huh. and of working on the acrobatic chords and working on the tedious stitching for the medallion you see all that's happening simultaneously you mm -hmm. don't have time to get you don't have time to get bored <laughs> yeah, I bet. in fact i'm kind of seeking boredom these days <laughs> the days are not long enough. Well, somebody wants to know, where do you get your yarns? And do you have like this enormous stash at your studio? Or do you order yarns when you get ready to make your work? Where do you buy your yarns? Because you're in Paris right now, right? I've been here since 1964, and I'm here today. So where, how, do you, how do you source out your yarns? Which year? <laughs> Uh, this year. <laughs> so for next, for this coming year, perhaps. No, for this coming year. Uh huh. 2023. How are we going to manage to get the yarns and the and the materials we want? So I'm going to answer the telephone. I'm going to open the mail. I'm going to um, spend a lot of time looking online. Mm -hmm. What's surfacing? What's happening? What people are our, uh, our marketing and showing because it's so nice now you can uh, be everywhere just sitting in your kitchen you, know, you can cruise 
you can spy. You can see what everybody's doing and you can see what everybody's trying to sell or to make or do. And then you say, how about, could you do this plus this, but not this? And they say, I'll try. Okay, send me a sample. Or take a photograph and send me the photograph this afternoon. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and how long would it take to make 40 kilos like that? And if we need another additional 40 kilos, how much longer would it take to recite, receive the second group? You see, because we think uh -huh. we do and get it passes. If it passes the test and the people like it, they may want to do the whole room like that. And then we can't, can't say, well, too bad. We don't have enough material or we can't get any more. Right, right. So these are the kind of things that when you work on projects or environments, not just in your artist studio of playing with a certain thing that you already have in hand. Mm -hmm. Because it depends on what scale you're talking about. If you're working on something just in a pleasurable way in your studio and you have it in hand already, mm -hmm. and where did you get it? Well, maybe you bought it in the flea market, or maybe you bought it in a closeout of some factory that's gone under, of which there are many that have gone under, so that they sell and they let you know that they have uh, very uh, ready to sell for almost any price if you just come and haul away certain materials. Or others like the <clears throat> stainless steel fibers that we started using coming from Japan from a tire company. Mm, right, right. Those were kind of amazing, which we can no longer get. So we have uh, things that look like them, act like them, but are not them. But that are in that are not flammable because that was mm -hmm. one of the big advantages. Um, oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Light fastness is one of the very important features. So, in working with people who are working, who are making materials out of pure pigment, not just oh dye, right, not applying dye to fibers, but that the fibers are amalgamated with some kind of pure pigment, so that they don't fade. They can't fade because it's pure pigment. Um, that we found, um, we were contacted by someone who offered us some kind of uh, samples of this kind of material. And we started working with it and it was uh, interesting because they said people were using it for garden furniture, for um, boat furniture, things like uh -huh. this. And I said, okay, well that means it's light fast, that means it's waterproof, not waterproof, but water resistant. resistant huh? Right. Uh -huh. Um, anyone that tells me they've got some kind of new fiber that is has some kind of feature that we don't know about, um, can you send a sample? You know, can we try and see what it might suggest? Could be on a very small scale. Uh huh. But then again, it could be as big as the Brooklyn Bridge. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Well, this was a wonderful question, and, and we're almost to the end here. I, I can't believe we're almost done today, but this is from Anna Boutin Cooper, and she wants to know, first she said, thank you very much for being on the show, and I, I say that too. She's wondering, what advice would you give to a young fiber artist creating today? What advice? Um, <laughs> have a good breakfast. <laughs> there you go. Anything else? I would say there's no such thing as yes and no. It's everything is maybe. Uh -huh. It all depends on uh, your own uh, enthusiasm and uh, stubbornness. Stubbornness. <laughs> of what you want to try and do. Somebody would like to know, what is your relationship to color? Is it emotional or visceral? Um, and what was Albert's influence on you? Uh, white, white is my favorite color. Okay. And uh, you remember the painter Soulage, French? Uh -huh. 
black was his favorite color. Uh -huh. um, so every like Wednesday, maybe red is your favorite color. Friday might be purple. And depends if you're sitting on a sandy beach, you know, yeah. and looking in a different direction. Um, you can't separate yourself from color unless you're colorblind. So it's affecting you always in some way. And you harness and do something with it or you ignore it, depending on your mood. That sounds like you have a relationship with color in your own way. And that it's a moving everyone target. Does. Everyone does, everyone does. Uh -huh. Everyone does and um, and there are no rules because it's continually changing. You know, it's like food, it's continually changing. You find something that appeals to you, something that makes you sick. William Storms. Hi, William. He was on here on our show once before. He wants to know what advice can you give to artists fighting the stigma of fiber as a niche craft in the, in the art gallery world? Get better. Do the best work you can and then get better. Mm -hmm. And then work harder and then learn more and apply it to whatever it is you're trying to do. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter how people judge what you're doing. It's up to you to place it at its level in what you're hoping to do and what you enjoy doing. Who cares about the label? Um, somebody wants to know, did you ever have a favorite project out of everything that you've worked on? Yeah, well, you know, it's a hard question because I've been working for 60 years, so I mean. <laughs> you've done a lot of work. <laughs> it's like, it's like your children grow up too and you, you know, you have, yeah. good, memories. You have good memories about certain periods and certain things. Yeah. Uh, um i could say anything i mean i've had a lot of fun doing a lot of things and i've had a lot of headaches doing a lot of things that they didn't come out the way i imagined or thought they should or wished so um it's a big masadwan you know it's a big uh, one if i could cite one thing that i still like um Can I send you a telegram? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I'll think of something that I really still like. I would also think there's almost like you could, if you could separate out the actual making of the work versus all the nuts and bolts part of it, like the installation and the shipping and blah, blah, blah. Do you, do you find that you can separate them out and just think about a piece of work of, I loved making that, or I love designing that? It's all together. It's a whole, Is it? uh, yeah, it's tremendous. And, and what I've been through and tried to make and do, I can, in no way can I take credit for it and thinking of it just as something I made because it's involving so many different other talents and, and people to who, whom I'm grateful because a lot of it has to do with teamwork. Mm -hmm. Even my children helped me when I was when they were little. They oh, really? Me, sure, they'd come home from school and they'd help me sew the Ford Foundation medallions. Really? Because they would sit in the back of the canvas and I would sit in the front and we'd push the needle back and forth, back and forth. And we could speak and say, so then what happened? So why didn't you pass your history test today? Why didn't you do it? <laughs> so we made, you know, there's a lot of dialogue going on in this kind of work. Yeah, yeah. And they have memories too with things that they liked, that they remember growing up with. 
And then why'd you put it in the bathtub and dye it and change the color? Were you able to take them with you when you did installations in different places? Yes, they have lots of good memories. I bet. I bet. Well, Sheila, I can't believe I have to say this, but I think we have to stop for today. Thank you so, so much for being here. This has been an honor to be able to talk with you today. And it's been the buzz. Everybody has been so excited to see you and hear you today. Thank you for being here. Happy anniversary. Thank you. <laughs> Happy anniversary ahead of time for Thank you. you. <laughs> we look forward to seeing you in New York. Yes. Thank you. Um, I do want to thank our sponsor today for Sheila's program. Again, it's the Weavings Guild of St. Louis, and it's in memory of Dorothy Haddock. Dorothy, I hope you're happy with this today. Um, I can't think of a better person to have interviewed. And thank you, the St. Louis Guild. They've been very supportive of Textiles and Tea. We appreciate it. If you're interested in some uh, in an and being a sponsor, please go to our website at weavespendie.org and you too can sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea. Um, if, we wanna thank everybody for supporting us um, with your donations. I'm excited to say that we are at 119 donations to celebrate our 100th anniversary and our 100th episode, I mean. So thank you all so much. It was so nice to, to the, do this celebration of 100 episodes and your donations are greatly appreciated. If you haven't noticed, today is Giving Tuesday. You might be getting calls from the HGA staff thanking you for your donations to the Fiber Trust. If you wanna keep the celebration going, please do your part and donate to the Fiber Trust. You can do that online. Uh, at weavespindie.org. All those your donations help us keep this kind of program going and uh, allows us to do more interviews with, you know, the great Sheila Hicks. Thank you so much. If you missed any of the episodes, you want to watch this one again, I'm sure you'll want to. You can watch it on Facebook or later on, you can watch it on YouTube. We are excited that next week we will have Pam Howard on here and we will interview her. And again, thank you all so much. I am so grateful for your support. It's been an amazing 100 weeks and we look forward to another 100 weeks. Thank you all so much. Have a great week and happy tea.